In the previous video in this series, we talked about this need for a tool like Kubernetes. It's a tool that will help us orchestrate Docker containers such that we can deploy a service. It's great that we know why we need a service like Kubernetes, but it helps to know how this service works, at least on a high level. So what I'm going to do in this video is try to give a glimpse on how Kubernetes manages to orchestrate the workload on a cluster of machines. Before we dive into that though, it helps to maybe define the task that Kubernetes actually performs on our behalf. Because if you think about what needs to happen, we can write it down as a formula of sorts. One part of the equation is something that I'll call a deployment, which is basically just a recipe of containers that we would like to see running. So let's say we want to have two Raza open source containers with all sorts of machine learning models in them. Let's say that we want to have three Raza action servers. Let's say we also have a tracker service. The idea here is that this deployment can be seen as sort of a recipe list. It is a file that describes all the containers that I want to have running. And maybe the file also says how I would like all of these different containers and services to talk to each other. The next part of the equation would be the hardware. And what I'm referring to here is that we typically have a couple of servers or virtual machines that we would like to deploy these services onto. And these could be different kinds of machines. They don't all have to be the same, but you could argue that these are resources. Each machine will have some memory, some CPUs, and the whole point of Kubernetes is that we can take a file that describes our deployment and that given a set of hardware, we can turn that into a scalable Raza deployment that can adapt. And it's this that Kubernetes does for you. It is able to take a definition of a deployment and put that on hardware in a way that's easy to change. And it might be good to zoom in on this word, adapt. So something that we might want to have happen here is that we say, well, I have another VM that I would like to add to the cluster. The ability to add and remove resources is something also that Kubernetes can handle for you. Another thing that we might want to do is we might want to update our deployments over here. We might want to say, well, I don't just want to have two Raza open source containers running. Maybe I want to have three. And that's an update that Kubernetes can run on our behalf. Another update might be something along the lines of, well, I have a new version of a container. And that means that the software that's currently running inside of our VMs needs to update, but we want this to happen in such a way that the service doesn't go down. Another thing that might happen is that one of our resources actually goes down. We might get a network error or the VM might just break. In that case, we also want Kubernetes to adapt and maybe redeploy our services to other VMs. Maybe there's more resources available in another VM where we can redeploy some of our containers onto, but when resources go down, we also need a system that can change in order to keep the system running. This is what I mean with adapt. Kubernetes doesn't just deploy, it also makes it easy to update a deployment. Let's now start talking about how Kubernetes actually does this because we're going to have to introduce a couple of concepts in order to make it clear what's happening under the hood. So let's consider the simplified scenario where I only have two servers, VM1 and VM2. And let's also say that these VMs have resources. And I'll mainly focus on the CPU and RAM here, but let's say that both of these virtual machines have 12 CPUs and let's say 16 gigabytes of RAM each. Well, then one thing that I could maybe do conceptually is start thinking about ways of splitting those resources up. I could, for example, say, well, let's just have a little bucket here and let's allow that bucket to use two CPUs and maybe two gigabytes of RAM. And I can add more of these buckets of different sizes. So I've drawn a few more of these resource pools. And when you look at it from this resource perspective, you might start thinking, hey, I could deploy a Docker container inside of this. And what I can even do is say something like, well, I want to deploy my containers in such a way that I also replicate them across resources. So for example, let's say that I have my Raza open source container 
that is a container that's relatively compute intensive because it contains my NLU models as well as my policy models. Well, then that can go into a resource pool that has a lot of resources, let's say four CPUs. But I might want to have more than just one though. So I can say I also want to have one that's running on another VM. Now, what's great about this idea at least is that by splitting up my resources this way, I'm also able to distribute the load. I have two virtual machines that are running all of this, and should one of these two virtual machines go down, I might still have a running replica of a container running at least somewhere. And in this example, I only have two virtual machines and a replication factor of two for this Raza open source container, but you can imagine that we might have a larger Kubernetes cluster with more machines and maybe a larger replication factor. And I can do this for the Raza open source container that I would like to run, but I can also do that for my action server. I also want to have something for my tracker maybe. And let's say that I also have an Nginx container that can do some routing. Now these resource pools seem kind of useful. So let's give it a appropriate name. Kubernetes likes to call these resource pools pods. So I might have pod number one here, pod number two here, and etc. The idea here is that part of what Kubernetes does is it allocates VMs to represent these pods, these pods of resources, and given that you have pods at your disposal, which again, represent resources, you can start thinking about deployments in a slightly different way. You're no longer thinking in services, rather you're thinking about a deployment that's happening with some resources. Allocating these pods on VMs is something that Kubernetes does for you, but it really helps to have this mental model of what a pod represents. These pods can be seen as compute, but they also have an address of sorts. Every pod, has an IP address attached that's meant for internal use. The idea here is that these IP addresses can be used to connect services together. These IP addresses can be used to directly communicate between different pods, but we have to introduce a new abstraction in order to make this practical. There's this concept of a service. The idea behind a service is twofold. First, we want to link up these Docker containers that are running inside of pods and have them represent a single service of sorts. The idea here is that the service can have a single IP address and can then route traffic to the appropriate pod to do the computation. This is very useful because the IP address on a service is static, while the IP address on a pod can change over time. We have to remember that VMs might go down in production, so we can't presume these IP addresses internally to remain the same. But a service will guarantee that. Another benefit of having this abstraction that's known as a service is that we can also do some load balancing. When traffic gets in here, we can say, well, let's make sure that 50% of the load is sent to one pod and 50% is sent to the other pod. Now, I've only drawn one service here, but in a more elaborate deployment, like a Raza deployment, you'll have more than just one of these services. And it's important that we define our services appropriately because it's the only way for us to define a static IP address. Let's say that we have our agent inside of our Raza open source container running. Well, this agent needs to know where to find the action server for custom actions. This agent doesn't know about the internal IP addresses, but we can configure the agent to locate the service that in turn knows how to find the IP addresses for the action server. So let's now consider a bigger Kubernetes cluster that's running something in production. Then we can still imagine that we'd have a couple of our virtual machines or servers that internally are running some pods. Now you might be wondering at this point, well, it's great that we have all of these pods with their IP addresses, but where is the orchestration actually happening? Surely these VMs on their own are mainly tasked with running whatever's running inside of the pods. They're not communicating with each other who should be running what. Some of the actual orchestration doesn't happen here, but instead works on a separate set of VMs. You could say that the nodes that we have over here are the worker nodes, that's what they're commonly referred to. But a Kubernetes cluster typically also has 
some orchestration nodes. Sometimes these are also called master nodes, but the main thing that's important to know is that we do have some servers or VMs that are in charge of making sure that the worker nodes are doing what they're supposed to do. So when we think about services and all of these kinds of topics, we should remember that there are separate nodes in the cluster that are making sure that everything is still working. Should a pod over here go down, then it will be these nodes that will detect something's happened, and it will be these nodes that are tasked to redeploy the broken pod. You could also say that it's these master nodes that allow us to rethink what compute looks like. Because in practice, you won't be thinking in terms of servers or working nodes. Instead, you are going to rethink the concept of resources into, well, this notion of pods. When you're interacting with Kubernetes, you're typically not interacting with these separate virtual machines. The whole point of Kubernetes is that you can think in different abstractions. You may interact with these pods instead, because that's the main mental abstraction at play here. It is good to know that in the back, every VM over here is running a process that is making sure that pods are running correctly and there's a process on these virtual machines that's communicating with the processes that are running on the worker nodes. But in terms of abstraction, it's much more useful to think about these pods. So maybe this is a better mental model. A Kubernetes cluster has a couple of these orchestration servers that are making sure that pods are running, but it's these pods that we are going to mainly focus in on. One thing I would like to point out here is that given all of these separate pods, Kubernetes does have this other abstraction that's known as a namespace. We might say, well, we've got this collection of pods and resources and settings, and that we're going to refer to as the Raza namespace. It might also be that on the same Kubernetes cluster, we are running multiple larger deployments. We could have the company website also running on the same Kubernetes cluster. The main idea with these namespaces is that sometimes there's a need to group resources and settings together. You may have multiple teams using the same Kubernetes cluster, and having a namespace ensures that you have a neat separation between teams. Another benefit is that you can also have services inside of a namespace. One way of looking at this is that we can indeed have services that offer static IP addresses within a namespace. And this is nice because that way, different pods might know how to reach other pods within a namespace. It should be said though that everything that I'm describing here still happens within the Kubernetes cluster. You might have a service that's running, but the outside world doesn't know how to communicate with that just yet. One of the final abstractions that I would like to highlight in this video is this idea of ingress. You could look at this as the portal to the outside world, so to say. And typically what you would use this for is you would have not an IP address, but rather a live endpoint on the web. Let's pretend that this endpoint is live at chat.app. And this is where the web traffic would come in. And then the ingress can then forward that to a service. The idea is that from here, a request would maybe come in, this pod would be able to handle it, but it might need to communicate with another service, which again routes traffic to, let's say, another pod in order to complete the request. But all of that is abstracted away by Kubernetes. The only thing you really have to do is configure what you would like the hardware to run. On a very high level though, these are the main components inside of a Kubernetes cluster. The next step for us would be to learn a little bit more about how to use the tools. We'll later see that if you want to run a Kubernetes cluster that you typically will be dealing with YAML files that contain the settings for all these different pods and for our deployment in general, and that you would then have to pass that along to a command line app. Typically, you would use kubectl or kube control for this. But as far as jargon goes, we've discussed some of the bigger topics in this video. Before wrapping up though, I do want to highlight one big thing, and that is that I certainly have skipped a lot of technical details. The goal of this video is to give you an intuition, but I do want to acknowledge that there are many nitty gritty topics that I've not talked about. One of these topics is security, but another big topic has to do with state and databases. And on that topic, I do want to mention one thing, and that is that all of these pods that we are running inside of our namespace, inside of Kubernetes, 
they are kind of ephemeral. The only thing they're using is compute and memory. So if a pod were to go away, we can just replace it with another one. But let's now say that we have a pod that actually is running a database. Well, a database is typically stored on disk. So if we had a database inside of a pod and that pod were to go down because a VM broke, then we would lose all of our data. Now inside of Kubernetes, there are definitely still different ways of dealing with this phenomenon. There's one feature called a stateful set, but you would still need to think about ways of doing backups. And this is also one of the reasons why databases are sometimes used outside of a Kubernetes cluster as a separate service. We will come back to this particular phenomenon in a later video, but I do wanna observe that I'm skipping lots of details in my explanation of a Kubernetes cluster. Given these concepts though, I do think we can move on to the next part, which is running a Kubernetes cluster on the local machine just to show what it might be like to run some pods and containers yourself. And I hope you stay tuned for that video.